In the name of creating, redeeming, and sustaining God. Amen. Hello, all saints. It's good to be home. Away these past few weeks, I followed with grief the convulsions of violence taking place all across the world. I thought about all of you and prayed for our leadership and for our resolve. What a joy it was to see the All Saints announcement that we were altering business as usual one month ago to march in the streets. That's my All Saints, my peeps. <laughs> Bearing witness for peace and justice. I was so proud to share your witness with Danish relatives and friends it made me teary. You gave a different face to American Christianity than the one they often see or hear about in the press. I also had the opportunity to share your witness and strengthen the hope of the rector in Copenhagen who oversees the entire Anglican community in Denmark. Our light shines bright in these dark events. Still, confronted with racism and gun violence in our country and watching our own American neo-fascism grow, I felt helpless, angry, and fearful. On our trip, my 16-year-old daughter, Emma, confided in me that the first thing she and her friends do when they go to the movies or to a concert or to an event like Pride is to look for places to hide or escape in case of a shooting. She has joined the heartbreaking vigilance of millions of children on our streets and across the world that live in fear of a violent death. I find myself questioning, are we making a difference? Can we really affect change. That's why I'm particularly grateful for these readings. Here Jesus helps us with our vulnerability, fear, and despair. He also teaches us how to sustain our hope and ground our lives. The setting of this gospel is Jesus' long walk towards Jerusalem. As Jesus walks, crowds of people flock to be near him. There is desperation in this crowd. They were oppressed, poor, and harassed by violent powers of a crushing empire. They needed hope and connection to meaning. With compassion and tenderness, Jesus pauses to address their needs and fears. Do not be afraid, little flock, he says. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus knew that it is God's joy to give to us always and everywhere. As a Jewish mystic, he believed that the whole universe was the very heart of God expressed in time and form. God's dynamic reality keeps the planets in orbit, flowers blooming, and babies smiling for no good reason other than love itself. God's generosity is not conditionally given when we are good, like I thought growing up. It is given freely with no strings attached. I believe Jesus got this notion of God's joy in giving from the mothers and fathers in his life. At home, he heard his mother sing her Magnificat including the words, he has filled the hungry with good things. That song resonated with the songs of the mothers of the faith before her, songs of God's generosity towards those in need. He knew that what seemed utterly impossible for us was possible for God. 
which allowed him to walk toward a world being torn apart by hatred and violence, trusting God's solidarity with his suffering and the power of love to transform even death. But what does it mean that God has given us the kingdom? Jesus is not talking about a place or an afterlife. The kingdom of God is now this world, but without racism, poverty, or any attempt to promote hate towards any members of the human family. How different this is from our later notions of salvation, which pushed the kingdom of God into the future, pairing it with eternal reward and punishment. Tragically, our criminal justice system mirrors this emphasis on punishment and damnation and disproportionately incarcerates people of color. Latina theologian Ada Maria Asasi Diaz offered the word kingdom rather than kingdom as a way of understanding what Jesus is talking about. The endless joy and peace and shared life at the heart of God is what is deepest within us and everyone else. But we have to be awake to it. We are prone to losing sight of God in us and ourselves in God. When we are awake to the kingdom reality, we see ourselves and everybody else the way God does. Everyone is beloved, and all those pushed to the margins are the guests of honor. Absolutely everyone has a place at the table including mothers with crying babies. <laughs> it's where faith the size of a mustard seed can yield a huge tree and compassion like yeast can leaven the whole world. It's not powered by guns and protected by walls. It is powered by community, and the peace and safety that comes when no person is left vulnerable and alone. This is the trajectory of our world, and God promises us that we can co-create it together. The gospel story of abundance says that our lives not only begin with God, our lives end in God. This well-being cannot be taken from us no matter what we face. Nothing can separate us from God's fierce and bonding love. Jesus knows that we are radically vulnerable and he addresses that first before he asks us to do anything else because Jesus knows that we are more courageous, more generous, and more compassionate when we are securely loved. Our vulnerability is the source of our common humanity, the basis for shared search for comfort and healing. When we are awake to God's compassion and generosity towards us, we can be released from the grip of personal fear and set free to invest in caring for the vulnerability of others. This is what Jesus means by making purses for ourselves that do not wear out. By investing our time and resources into caring for others, we align our hearts with God's heart, and our own sense of purpose deepens. We feel hope and joy. As Antonio Gallardo puts it, it's investing in the B of H the bank of making heaven on earth. A number of years ago, I witnessed the power of kingdom when I volunteered at a school in Pasadena that was set up for kids who were having trouble or flunking out of the standard high schools. I was paired up with an amazing woman counselor. 
We established a weekly support group for 15 students who are failing this continuation school. Week after week, we just showed up and listened and cried. We learned that one 15-year-old had to choose every day between going to school or staying home with her grandmother who was dying of cancer. She was the sole caretaker. One day, another teenager arrived to group beside himself in raging and anguished tears, having witnessed the severe beating of a neighbor into unconsciousness by law enforcement. He wailed, black people have no rights. We cried with him, sat with him, and validated his anger at the crushing injustice. It didn't feel like much to offer, but guess what? Despite our limitations and our feelings of inadequacy, those beautiful, amazing human beings came to empathize with each other. They gave each other and us advice. We never once talked about going to school or doing homework or paying attention in class. At the end of the year, every single child was on the honor roll. Every single one. That, my friends, is the power of the kingdom. Authentic hope requires clarity, seeing the troubles in this world, and imagination to see what lies beyond situations that feel immutable. Our country is going through a tumultuous time. Political discourse is coarsening, fears are heightened, and people are on edge. But that which makes us human, the ability to feel empathy has not vanished. Another mother of faith, Ghazala Khan, believes that too, asserting all of America felt my pain. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he meant a public life reorganized towards neighborliness. Reverend William Barber of Moral Monday exhorts us to claim a higher ground in our partisan debates by returning public discourse to our deepest moral and constitutional values, equality and representation under the law, and the desire for peace, love, and harmony within and among nations. Hope isn't something you just think about. It's something you do. I want to share one last thing that sustains me when the present feels like a nightmare version of the movie Groundhog Day. In my work as a psychologist and in my own life, I have come to recognize just how unpredictable change really is. There are times when change takes tremendous effort, sustained over a long period of time. And sometimes it takes barely a breath for a whole new way of being to emerge. Effects are not proportionate to causes. Change is messy and fluid. Even though we know that compassion, respect, and honesty promote change, we can never know the exact moment when something new will emerge, nor finally, what will make that coalescence happen? We live in a both-and universe of relatively predictable patterns and wildly unpredictable emergence. Cause and effect assumes that history marches forward, but as Rebecca Solnit writes, history is not an army. It is a crab scuttling sideways. 
a drip of soft water wearing away stone, an earthquake breaking centuries of tension. Just this week, I was blown away when I learned that the Olympic Committee had chosen for the first time ever a refugee team to compete. Ten athletes, heroes from the margins, united as one team. We never know the rippling effects of even the smallest act of kindness or generosity. But we can trust that no act awake to compassion that cares for the vulnerability of others is ever wasted. Hope demands things of us that despair does not. Jesus said, do not be afraid. Trusting in God's generosity, we can say with one voice, forward together, not one step back. Amen.